Hello, this is the HatchetJob.com gaming netcast with a first impressions, a partial first impressions uh, video of Earth Reborn, published by Zedman Games and developed by Christophe Belanger, who also did Dungeon Twister. And I, I hope I said his name right. This game is set uh, in the future after an apocalypse, and two groups of uh, people come out of their bunkers and have at it. One group are North American soldiers, the other group are North American Satanists essentially. And in video game terms, because I'm a video gamer and Hatchet Job is primarily, though not exclusively, a video game uh, netcast, this would be, I guess, a first-person shooter uh, with uh, tactical gameplay, objective-based elements, RP very light RPG aspects, and uh, asymmetrical gameplay because the teams have different types of powers. Now, this is a review copy, so I didn't pay for this, and I want to make make it clear that I didn't finish all the tutorial missions in the game. I've only done five of them. So my experience isn't of somebody who's played it loads and loads, but I have put 10 or 15 hours into it in its entirety. But it is of somebody who is familiar with video games and thought this looked interesting and sees synergy between this and uh, game video games on the market. I'll let you into a secret that I think it's it's got lots of potential, but it may not be for everybody, but you'll have to find out why that is at the end of the show. But anyway, let's get on with it. Earth Reborn. You can have a look at these uh, small characters, which are one of the most noticeable about things about the games, and you can see that they are very well sculpted. Um, very pert bottom there, and they're slightly... <laughs> slightly ridiculous boobs if you can get the profile in there and to give you a size of scale here's a character and here's a, a normal playing card and you can see kind of the scale of this figure here now you can see that this woman is carrying a sniper rifle and if we look at the base of her her name is Vasquez and you can see that there are these circles around it blue and red and orange and they represent her her arc of fire and how far she can fire and the blue circles represent melee so you can see that because she's a, a sniper rifle carrying character, or rather this character is very good with guns, she's got an enormous arc of fire for weapons, and it's not so good for melee. And of course this will also affect when she's attacked, for example, attacked from the back, she will take more damage than if she's attacked from the front. And all the characters have different arcs on them, because all the characters are different. So for example, if we look at this guy here, again, extremely well detailed you can see and he's carrying a, this is one of the evil characters he's carrying a saw on his left arm you can just turn it so just to give you an idea and these come uh, with the uh, the primer on I believe for painting and again I can give you an idea of his sense of scale next to a playing card if you look at his base he's got uh, he's quite vulnerable from the back you can see there, um, he's not terribly good with shooting, um, but if you look at the base you can just see, hopefully, that uh, he's got a kind of a light grey and light blue for melee, and then the whole section of him is, uh, is the darker blue for melee. And you'll notice that it's uh, more on his left side, which of course is, makes sense, because that's where his saw is. So when he's attacking, he wants to attack people within the line of fire for that, that blue section, and of course when he's attacked, um, the person attacking him doesn't want to attack on this side because of his saw. Now if we look at the, the character cards for them, so this is the character card for Vasquez, the woman I showed you, and uh, there are two sides, so there's this side here and this side which has kind of a, the, the mottled effect, uh, and they represent the different states for her, so she's not wounded and wounded. And if you look, it's quite easy to see that we have her armor rating and her health rating, then movement. Down here we get the uh, what bonuses she gets when she attacks people or um, when, when using a knife and uh, what her kind of strength of shooting is. And we also get these symbols which represent tests that she has to do in the game which allow her to do different things. And up here, this slightly odd symbol is a weight symbol, so that's a carrying limit because you can pick up items during the games. Uh, under certain conditions she can do what this says and what this basically says I won't explain it totally is that she can kind of seduce one of the other characters in the game because of course she has this uh, um, slightly uh, <laughs> melon like physique 
uh, and she can turn that character into a traitor. And so there's an RPG element to this because, of course, what she can do is different to what, for example, this, this baddie can do. He has different stats, again, uh, he doesn't have quite as good firing, but he has better melee. Um, and he has, again, different abilities that he can do during the game. And these, he can basically break down doors uh, much more e easily than other people. And again, he has a wounded side. The game is full of items that you can find uh, by searching through rooms. So what you do is you get into a room and you decide to search and you kind of rifle through cards until you find um, something that you can use. But of what you can pick up is limited. But if we look at these items that you can find, you get chainsaws, shotguns, smoke grenades, infrared goggles, and the items also have other sides. So they could be grenade launchers, morphine, heavy machine guns, motion detectors. And if we look at the smoke grenade. The smoke grenade, it obscures line of sight in an area, okay? So if you, for example, you're up against a sniper woman, you throw this down, you block her line of sight in, in that particular area. However, if she has, if I can find it, infrared goggles, well, when it's on, you can see through the smoke, so it negates it. And then the other items in the game include things like uh, trip mines, mines, jetpacks, uh, zombie control devices, uh, Wolverine style claws, all sorts of crazy stuff. The game comes with different sorts of tiles for its board, so you get L shapes, uh, then T shapes and so on, another smaller L shape, squares, single squares, uh, big rooms, and these rooms, if I go into macro mode, these rooms, rooms and the, the, uh, the tiles for the game can be inside or outside, so you can have a mixture of different types of terrain. If you look at this outside card, uh, you can see that there are, there are eyes on it, which means that this is a, it blocks line of sight, so effectively this is cover. Now you can't pop out of cover and shoot like you can in a video game, but you can take, you can hide behind it. So for example, if you're trying to make your way up a map, so imagine this is part of a larger map, you might hide behind cover, um, but the enemy team can actually destroy it if they want to, so they can take cover away. Likewise, if we turn to the inside, you can see that this has an edge here and a space here. Well, you can, uh, when you're building the, the game, you might have to put a door here. You can break through doors. You can also break through walls. So if you find that your area in one, one way is blocked, well, you can bust through the wall uh, if you have sufficient firepower. Or you, you roll properly, so that's that. You know, it has kind of destructible terrain. You can destroy cover. You can also destroy the inside. Rooms will also uh, sometimes have these these diagrams on. I won't explain what they mean, but basically, the rooms have something in it that you can interact with. So this is infirmary. So under cer certain conditions, I can come in here and I can uh, spend some points and roll some dice to, to do a test. And if I succeed, I'll get some health back that you can see there. However, you can also destroy objects or these things in a room. So if I wanted to, I could come in here, heal my guy up like this, and then decide, well, I don't want the enemy to get hold of this, so I'll destroy this entire room. And so the rooms have missile launches in, places to, to create zombies, video camera equipment, and all sorts of different stuff. Now, the most interesting part of the game for me are the command points and order tile. This little token is a command point, and this is an order tile. And you can see that on the order tile, there are different symbols. So you have a, a, a symbol for movement on the left, then the top is firing, the right-hand side is interacting with an object like the infirmary, then you have melee. But order tiles are different. So on this one, we have the magnifying glass, which means you're investigating an area, you're searching for something, you know, those items that I showed you before, the guns and smoke bombs, etc. And melee again, shooting, and another movement, okay? The way order tiles and the command points work is this. 
So at the start of my turn, I get some command points. And this amount depends on various factors in the game, but it's fixed, okay? So once they're out, they're out for that turn. And I get some order tiles. What I can do is I can say, spend, uh, take an order tile, put it on a character and say, I'm gonna spend a command point to get that character to shoot. And of course, now I have fewer order tiles and I'm down on command points. And then in, in my next go, I might say, okay, I'm spending a order tile or using an order tile here, and I'm going to get that character to move. And again, I'm down on command points and order tiles. But what I can do is I can use multiple order tiles on one character. So I can then say, okay, she's gonna shoot, and then maybe she'd she'd move, and I can I can do multiple things in the same go for that character. What's more than that is when I decide to shoot, I can spend extra command points to uh, essentially increase the chance of that shot landing, or extra command points to increase the chance of doing extra damage with that gun. Again, abstracted. But you'll notice that I'm running out of command points here, and I'm I'm running out, I don't have any order tiles left, so if I spend spend it all on this person, and there, there are maximum command point limits that you can spend on a character. But for argument's sake, if I spent all the order tiles and all the command points on this character, I wouldn't have any for this character. And I can also spend uh, or use the uh, order tiles to chain uh, commands between characters. So if I, if I got the right one, I could get both of these guys to fire at the same enemy, assuming they had line of sight. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing two things. I'm managing resources because I'm trying to figure out who best to spend these on. And I'm managing risk because if I know I have to roll dice to, to fire at somebody, well, I can add extra command points to, to, to make sure that or to increase the chance of the shot hitting. But I'm using up my fuel. I'm using up my potential to do anything else. Likewise, if I, if I draw bum order tiles, well, I can spend command points to discard one and bring a brand new one in. But again, it's stopping my ability to do everything. And you have to remember, you're not just going to be managing two people. You'll be managing three or four people, or you might have extra zombies to manage in there as well. And so the, the, the question you have to think about is, what do I want to do? What can I afford to do? What will I have to do in the future? Um, will there be any situations where I need to get myself out of a jam and I either won't have the right order tile or I won't have enough command points? And then the other layer on that is, of course, the characters are different. So you might say, well, I've only got one character I can use on this term, and uh, she's not very good at shooting, so I'm going to use all my command points to, to put into her for shooting. And at the end of the turn, that's fine, because you don't really have any other options. But at the beginning of the term, you might think, well, I have to make a, a suboptimal decision with one character. I have to use, the, say, the shooting character to blow something up. I don't really want to do it, but I have to do it now. So I'm going to burn through some command points to, to increase the chance of that explosion working, um, realizing that later on in the turn, I'm, I might have scuffered myself. And so that's really interesting because it's risk and reward, it's resource management. And although there is randomness in that you have to roll dice to figure out if you successfully shoot somebody, or you have to roll dice to figure out if you, you know, throw a grenade successfully or whatever it is, you can minimize that by by spending your command points, but you know you might need them later. And I think that's a very elegant uh, solution that allows you to do lots of things. So here's kind of a, a serving suggestion for the game. I've just laid out tiles randomly, it's not a real game in progress, and here you can see some of the tile size next to a playing card. There are other things that I didn't mention in the, the previous uh, segments. Uh, so, for example, when you start your turn and you move your guys, you know, on squares, your opponent can actually interrupt you if you move into his line of sight and so on. So although it is turn 1, turn 2, it's kind of turn 1.5, turn 1.75. Uh, if your opponent wants to interrupt and try and kill you or whatever it is. And then more than that, your opponent can actually change the turn order by dueling you. And what that means is, uh, before you start uh, you know, a, a whole new section of turns, he can kind of say, okay, I'm going to duel you. And then what you do is you bet command points, and whoever bets the most command points then starts that turn. 
So again, there's another little risk reward thing where if you 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 desperately want to go first because you want to get to a room or you want to go and heal or whatever it is some some character you can you can bet to go first, but then you have fewer command points to actually use in that turn. There are other things going on where there are you can see a stack of um, mission cards, and so uh, that was good. You could hear that thump. That was a good thump. And so the mission cards, they give you objectives to do. And then the game kind of says, okay, well, here's the victory condition. And it is get to this many points within X amount of rounds, whatever it is. But how you do that is really up to you. Look at the mission cards and decide what tactics you want to do. Do you want to go and uh, pick up objects? Do you want to interact with rooms? Do you want to go straight, you know, just go all out to try and kill the other team? And then you work it out. I've also found that this is a game where stories happen. So... Uh, the first game I played, uh, I ended up, the, the first tutorial mission I played with my friend, we ended up in this kind of Mexican standoff where everybody was, was bunched up together pointing guns at each other. And I couldn't move because he would kill me. And therefore he didn't need to do anything because I would lose. And it was rather like a, a cult film you might have heard of. Now, that was kind of broken, but if something can happen like that in a game... That to me is a good thing because it shows that you have freedom to fuck up. And freedom to fuck up actually is empowering because it means you have freedom to experiment. It's, no, it's not on rails. In uh, another uh, another game, I was uh, I was being pursued by him and I wanted to slow him down. And I, 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 I went into a room to look for guns or something and I, I couldn't find any, but I found a gas mask. And then what I realised is I could send my guy out to a room um, have another one of my characters meet him uh, they could uh, the guy could give his gas mask to the other person because you can give objects if you can carry an object you can pass it to another character so that way uh, you know we'd be protected from gas because I had a toxic grenade and then what I could do is I if I was able to I could I could blow open the wall in a room throw the grenade that would then flood the area with gas and slow down my opposition and that kind of thinking, that makes perfect sense to video gamers. Uh, th this game, m mentally, if you think about the concepts of moving, shooting, melee, firing, cover systems, sharing uh, weapons, passing things over, weight limits, all of that makes perfect sense to video gamers. There's no conceptual leap here. Crazily, there's even more stuff, and this isn't something I was able to do. But once you go through all the tutorials, what you learn is a how to generate scenarios. And I think it works like this, but I'm not completely sure, where people kind of pick up tiles and lay them down. And then, depending on the tile they lay, right, they may be sacrificing points at the end of the game. Because I think the way it works is that you kind of start out with a pile of victory points, right? Um, like goals in football or whatever it is and then to gain an advantage in how the lap the map is laid out You can actually sacrifice them. That's crazy if that I think that's how it works. That's nuts Games should have that imagine counter-strike where you could slow down the attack on bomb a or what you know bomb site a or bomb site b But then it meant you'd have fewer weapons to choose from later on. So obviously I'm enthusiastic about this but I said at the beginning that I couldn't recommend that people run out and buy it, so why is that? Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, there's a usability issue, okay? So, what I'm doing is I'm filming on an old table, and it doesn't look particularly good, but I have studio lights in this room. They are daylight bulbs, okay? So they're kind of stuff that you use in photographers' studios. Now, and so it illuminates the tiles, but if you're in a, a normal house, then what I found is the tiles are actually quite dark and it's quite hard to see the borders of walls for doors and so on. So then the already reasonable setup time, kind of 10 or 15 minutes, 20 minutes, is compounded by the fact stuff is too dark. So you have to have a well-lit room. And uh, then you've got small design issues where, I'll flick to macro. This is kind of a, a board that you put around your pieces and it shows you all the little icons, right? Which is fantastic. But look at the background of the bloody thing. I mean, this is this is like giving, I don't know, it's like giving a brain surgeon instructions on a bloody Rubik's Cube or something, right? And so again, you've just got these small issues. Then, because it's a complex game, which is wonderful, and because there are so many pieces, which is wonderful, 
the rules, right, are substantial, right? It's a 44-page rule book with lots of illustrations and different stuff going on. And then there's kind of half the size of this scenario uh, guide. Now, what the rules do, which is excellent, is they kind of replicate the same mechanics for doing everything. So when you roll a dice and you figure out whether you want to increase fire or damage, you, you roll the similar dice to, to search for a room and you can make it easier to search for a room the same way. When you want to interact with a room, you can inter kind of interact with something in a room, you can, you can do the same thing. But there will always be little exceptions and little things that you kind of have to figure out. And so, because I wasn't able to play regularly, um, I, it was easy to forget the small stuff. And what I think is, the game has enormous potential, it has fantastic ideas, but it needs to be bought by somebody who's not only an experienced board gamer, but can dedicate time with a regular group, with the same person or people, repeatedly, to learn the scenarios, to go through them more than once, and to figure out the little nuances and quirks that it takes. And also, I think, almost to set up the game beforehand, so that when you have a gaming day, you say, okay, we're going to start off with Earth Reborn, and it's ready to go when you get there. Unless, of course, you're doing the scenario stuff. It's incredibly frustrating, because I'm excited talking about it. I'm, I, I, I tell video gamers about it, just because of its concepts. I think that, if anything in this, this video has interested you, go and download the rules, right? They're free to download and read them because it might give you ideas for things you'd like to see in video games. But unless you can, can ful fulfill those criteria, uh, criteria, I think, of a well-lit room, understanding video games, able to dedicate time, and being able to, you know, say we're going to set this up now, and having a regular group, think carefully before getting this. So there you are, that's Earth Reborn. Lots of pieces, lots of potential. Let's see how you do with it.